everybody. Hope you're doing okay today and that you survived the June or July 14th storm in Tucson. That's going to be, I think, put down as one of the bigger storms out here. Um, July 14th bomb dropped. And I uh, hope you're doing well. This is the morning devotion with Bo Willette, Bo O. And well, that's my last name. You could always check out the archives of these YouTube uh, kind of um, videos at the YouTube channel, Bo Willette. So Bo Willette, you could always watch it there if you're not on Calvary Christian Fellowship's Facebook page. And it is July 15th, so we're midway through July, and we're already halfway through 2024. Unbelievable. We got an election coming up. We had an attempted assassination on a former president of the United States. Um, we've had a couple huge storms uh, in our country already, and uh, just local storms all over the place. So it's been quite a trying time for sure in a lot of people's lives. Today is a day of massive cleanup, no doubt about it. Um, unless you pay people to clean your place, you're probably out there cleaning it. <laughs> and we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 5 today. And it's already been a long day for me, up early at around 6, outside cleaning and picking up and doing all that stuff. So it's good to kind of get to 9 o'clock and get in the Word. So I'm not sure how many of you are going to be able to be in. Hey, Casey, what's happening? And Paula, good to see you both. Um, I would imagine right now in town it's pretty uh, pretty crazy. So let's get into this uh Let's read Jeremiah 5. All these chapters seem to be a little long. Uh, I've noticed that. Um, it says, Run up and down every street in Jerusalem, saith the Lord. And remember, this is going to be news from Jerusalem, or news from the prophet Jeremiah uh, about the judgment that's going to be happening. It says, and this is to Jerusalem. Look high and low, search throughout the city. If you can find one just and honest person, I will not destroy the city. Mm. Gosh, wow, that's crazy. You know, you like to think that you're the one, right? Um, and he says, but even when they are under oath, saying, as surely as the Lord lives, they are still telling lies. Hmm. Wow, the human condition is a rough one. The Bible paints the most bleak, bleak, I'm saying like super bleak picture of humanity. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about the, the chosen people, the people who entered into a covenant with the true and living God, and they are out of touch, right? Um, and uh, man, you see just, gosh, if they're out of touch, then what about me? It says, Lord, you are searching for honesty. You struck your people, but they paid no attention. You crushed them, but they refused to be corrected. They are determined with faces set like stone. They have refused to repent. Mm. Gosh, Lord, have I refused to repent? You know, in a lot of, you know, there's an honesty that we need when we ask that question. There's a kind of a fear that raises its head that wants us to say, yeah, of course I've repented, you know, because we're, we fear that if we are honest and say, man, there's some things I have not repented for, that people will see us wrongly, or we won't be right with God, or uh, we won't receive that promise of God because now we have confessed negatively. You know, there's all kinds of interesting fears and insecurities that go into our heart. And we kind of have a, a, a religious show with it, a religious veneer over it. But really, when you kind of chip through through us, it's a lot of insecurity and a lot of uh, fear that's in us to just say, hey, I haven't repented of some things. There's some things that I just have not wanted to bring to the Lord, you know, and that's that's honest. Then I said, but what can we expect from the poor? They are ignorant. 
They don't know the ways of the Lord. They don't understand God's laws. So I will go and speak to the leaders. Surely they know the ways of the Lord and understand God's laws, right? Oh, those poor people don't know what they're doing. Us wealthy people certainly do, especially our leaders. I mean, look at their commercials on TV. I mean, aren't they so, you know, hmm, persuasive, right? <laughs> it says, but the leaders too, as one man had thrown uh, off God's yoke, had and broken his chains. So now a lion from the forest will attack them. A wolf from the desert will pounce on them. A leper will lurk near their towns, tearing apart any who dare to venture out. For the rebellion is great and their sins are many. So hey, just as the poor, just as the rich. Mm. In God's eyes, same. How can I pardon you? For even your children have turned from me. They have sworn by gods that are not gods at all. Even your children, your offspring. So this is something that's been entrenched, you know, in the family life of Israel. You know, what's the, what's the family life? Uh, what have I left for the family? You know, what is my kids, you know, worship? Uh, you know, who are they worshiping? Is it a reflection of my wife and myself? You know, are they in a sense like us? You know, um, you know, have we led them down wrong paths? And those are tough questions for parents. Cause the last thing you want to say is of course not, you know, certainly not. I take it. I'm sure if you had like a survey and you just said, Hey, parent, you know, did you lead your kid astray? They would go. Absolutely not. Nope, nope, nope. But, you know, I think if you get, again, honest, you know, and this is the tough part is pride, man, creeps in so much. You know, you go, oh, yeah, what we're usually saying when we say, of course, I didn't lead him astray is I did better than the other person. I did better than my parents. I did better than my grandparents. I did better than the neighbor down the road. I think I did better. But if you get honest, you'll realize that, man, there's some things that you didn't do so good and that you uh, pass those down too, you know, and uh, you see that the sins of the father and the mother uh, continue into the daughter and the son as well. And you see some of that too, the stubbornness, maybe the jadedness, maybe the false worship too, worshiping gods, moving away from the true and living God, you know, maybe because they saw your example or your lack of examples, you know, things like that. So it says, hey, they've sworn to gods that aren't even gods. You know, I fed my people until they were full. So God's not just into, the God of the Bible is not into just worshiping God. That's not what the God of the Bible is into. The God of the Bible is into correct worshiping of God. Right? So when someone says, oh, I just worship God, and we go, oh, great. Well, no, from Yahweh's perspective, the God of Israel, it's like, no, what is the evidence for you worshiping that God? Is there evidence? So he, the God of the Bible wants evidence for any other God's existence. Very cool, right? So it says, uh, um, I fed my people until they were full, but they thanked me by committing adultery and lining up at the brothels. They are well-fed, lusty stallions, each neighing for his neighbor's wife. Should I not punish them for their sins, says the Lord? Should I not avenge myself against such a nation? So you see that they just kind of gone their own way. You know, sexually just filled with lust, just doing their lustful things, you know, not thinking about God at all. And this, this definitely ring so true with our day we live in a super lustful culture all kinds of things right and uh gosh i mean we it's like we constantly live in adultery in our heart in our culture because of what we've allowed right it's like you know when i was a kid you had to go to the to the liquor store to like peek at maybe a magazine that might be behind the counter you know that that's kind of what you got you know if you found something in the trash it was like whoa you know today though everything's free and that is gnarly i mean it's gnarly it's it's hard for all of us right the temptations are super huge no matter what what social platform you're on what your internet you're on you know you, you see emails that come in or different things that come in and they're all there's some of them they're super risky right and so it's it's just a weird time like that, you know, 
now you can think of a culture that just everybody just hey says you know what i'm just gonna we're just gonna you know be swingers man we're just swinging that's how we're doing this thing i mean it, it seems like you know they're worshiping of false gods really tied in to this sexual promiscuity and there's a difference here a lot of us struggle with sexual lust but we aren't necessarily wanting to worship like the goddess Diana, you know, that kind of thing. But then there's then there's the worship of Diana, like a false uh, fertility god, right? There's the worshiping of that deity that has in its worship ceremonies that are sexual, if that makes sense to you. You know, that's usually not what we're doing. Usually people struggle with some kind of sexual lust as they do with other forms of lust, right? Lusting power, right? Lusting money upon money. Lusting food. Lusting drink. Lusting TV, right? Lusting music. Man, like an over... You can overreach. You can, your lust can go in all different ways to where you're no longer really doing the right thing because you are literally obsessed and consumed by something. Yeah. And it really has affected your spiritual life, the way you see God, which is of uttermost importance. So it says, go down to the vineyards. This is verse... Uh, uh, 10, by the way, go down to the rows of the vineyards and destroy the grapevines, leaving scattered few alive. Strip the branches from the vines, for these people do not belong to the Lord. The people of Israel and Judah are full of treachery against me, says the Lord. They have lied about the Lord and said, he won't bother us. No disasters will come upon us. There will be no war or famine. God's prophets are all windbags who don't really speak for him. Let their predictions of disaster fall on themselves. Oh, that Jeremiah, oh, those Isaiah guys, you know, man, they're always just bagging, always just so harsh. <clears throat> Maybe there is a judgment that I need to go through. You know, maybe when God, you know, strikes, you know, maybe when even a disaster hits, just maybe, is it really wrong to say, hey, you know what, God, you know, you've allowed this and that there's something I need to pay attention to, you know, or do we just ignore it and say, that's not God, that's the devil. <laughs> you know? And and we refuse to really look at our lives. And that's what Israel's doing. They're just really refusing to look at their lives, no matter what comes their way, Nash, you know, a disaster of, uh, you know, a flood or an earthquake or whatever it is, uh, you know, or war for that matter. They're just not willing to look at themselves. You know, what's going to get their attention? You know, what's going to get my attention? And that can be a frightening uh, question. Therefore, this is what the Lord of heaven uh, and the ar of heaven's armies say. Because the people are talking like this, my messages will flame out of your mouth and burn like people like kindling wood or burn the people like kindling wood. O Israel, I will bring a distant nation against you, says the Lord. It's a mighty nation and an ancient nation, a people whose language you do not know, whose speech you cannot understand. So this is Babylon, right? The weapons, they're pretty old, old place, right? We read about the old Babylon, Tower of Babel, you know, kind of thing, maybe. Their weapons are deadly. Their warriors are mighty. They will devour for food uh, of your harvest. They will devour your sons and daughters. They will devour your flocks and herds. They will devour grapes and figs. They will destroy your fortified towns, which you think are so safe. You know, what do I think today is really safe? Do I really think I'm safe? You know, where am I really only safe? You know, and this is what Jesus was so amazing about. Don't worry about those who will destroy the body. Man, you should be more concerned about your relationship with God. And that's so powerful, right? You know, am I really safe in my home? Well, not when a big storm comes and rips the roof off. Not that safe. Not when the emergency comes in and says, go in the basement now. <laughs> uh, no basement, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's like, you know, only God is really can be our refuge and our for fortress, right? That place we can run to.
Yet even in those days I will not blot out you completely, says the Lord. And when you your people ask, why did the Lord our God do all this? You must reply, you rejected him and gave yourselves to foreign gods in your own land. Now you will serve foreigners in a land that is not your own. Hey, you're, you're going to be uprooted and moved. Maybe that's why we all move. Maybe that's why, in a sense, nations have moved. You know, people groups have moved. Maybe there's been an uprooting. You know, because of issues, problems, iniquity, stuff like that. It's very interesting to think through through why we're where we're at today, right? Why do they live in Australia? Why do they live here? Why do they live there? You know, those kind of questions, really interesting. A lot of turmoil is going to be uh, found out in those answers. So we finish up by going through this last section, a warning for God's people. Make this announcement to Israel and say to Judah, listen, you foolish and senseless people with eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear. Right? Jesus talks about this. Right? You have eyes but don't see. You have ears that don't hear. This is what's from Isaiah as well. And you have no respect for me. Why don't you tremble at my presence? Jesus talks like this, right? Why are you not listening to me? He says, I, the Lord, define the ocean's sandy seashore I, uh, and an everlasting boundary that the waters cannot cross. The waves may toss and roar, but they can never pass the boundaries I set. But my people ha- are, have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They have turned away and abandoned me. They do not say from their heart, let us live in awe of the Lord, of God, uh, uh, Lord our God, for he gives us rain and spring each spring and fall, assuring us of a harvest when the time is right. Your wickedness has has deprived you of these wonderful blessings. Your sin has robbed you of all these good things. Among my people are wicked men who lie in wait for victims like a hunter hiding in a blind. Uh, they continually set traps to catch people like a cage filled with birds. You know, their society was one of constant preying on people. Businesses that would prey on calamity, people that uh, a system that was set up to where there was an exploitation of people's vulnerabilities. I mean, isn't that what we have today? I mean, in our world, a system that is set up on people's vulnerabilities. Someone just loses something. They lose all their money, and yet you're going to charge them more money to get things fixed so that they can live? It, it just doesn't make sense, right? Someone gets a disease, and you, you're charging them you know, money to help them with their disease? You know, that's a life-threatening disease? It's like, and, and you're taking all their savings, maybe having them sell their home, it doesn't it doesn't sound like love at all it doesn't sound like care at all it doesn't sound like business ethics at all it sounds exploitive and that's sad you know you write your mayor you write your governor and say isn't this an exploitation you know these systems and and they don't, no one wants to respond you know it's so sad and cuz we're all a part of it you know, and we, we are that messy. And so I see ourselves in this, right? They lie in wait, you know, a system that lies in wait for people, right? Continuing setting traps, right? Creating the disease and creating the solutions. That's how it works. Like, and it says we're like caged birds, right? And it says their homes are filled with evil plots, and now they are great and rich. Always thinking of how to get money, you know, using your, you know, your home for things that aren't good, right? You know, exploiting, you know, people sell their kids out of their own home. That's something that happens, right? Gnarly, you know? Stuff like that is crazy, right? But, you know, we're all, we all, all that stuff is in us all, all that yuck. They are fat and sleek, and there's no limit to their wicked deeds. They refuse to provide justice to orphans and deny the rights of the poor. Should I not punish them for this, says the Lord? Should I not avenge myself against such a nation? You know, hey, those that can't afford that would be considered poor. They can't afford that service. But it's exploited. Oh, yeah, you can do it, but you just need to sell your land. You just need to sell everything and give us it. And then we'll help you, you know. Mm. 
horrible and shocking thing has happened in this land. The prophets give false prophecies and the priests rule with an iron hand. And so it seems like there's this kind of religious veneer that's on everything. Um, all the ministers are just sharing, but they really don't want to tell the truth. Worse yet, my people like it that way. But what will you do when the end comes? Mm. Maybe sometimes when we're all yay, 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 maybe we're really wrong. That's really scary to think. Because when you're in the yay, yay, yay mode, when you're in a crowd and everything's, you know, hooray, hooray, and everything's cheery, the last thing you're thinking of is that I'm wrong. You're there and you think you're right. It's really a keen person, the one who is skeptical and takes a break and says, hey, you know, really what, what is going on here? And is there something that's being avoided? You know, sometimes in the church we call one thing bad, but we neglect so much worse things. And it's weird how within a church environment, what I have found is that, that there's certain sins that can be really talked about and honed in on, and yet other ones are absolutely not spoken of not touched at all you know so like for instance in jeremiah there's sexual sins that's being talked about that's really prominent you have a lot of pastors love to kind of really hammer on that but they don't like to hammer on the other thing jeremiah talks about right the exploitation of money to get rich the the greed the wanting to live high and at the expense of others, getting your money at the expense of others, seeing how the system has exploited things, speaking about how bad it is to treat people like we treat people. Sometimes we neglect those things, the justice issues, right? Treating people right, orphans, the people in need and we just kind of point at th that one thing that we we all really thinks bad you know and it's all bad there's no doubt about it but Jesus did say the whores and the tax collectors will enter the kingdom before the Pharisees hmm. and I love C.S. Lewis's line on this on that passage is that yeah you know you don't want to be either you know, a Pharisee or the tax collector or the whore. But C.S. Lewis points out the diabolical sin is the pride of the Pharisees, right? Mm. Yeah. So maybe the pride that you have in your life is far, far worse than that person on Hollywood and Vine. Mm. And maybe, just maybe, you know, we have to deal with all of it. And that that's tough in our life. And it's tough in the body of Christ as well. Jeremiah, though, 5 really lays it out to Israel. And that certainly is convicting to us. And it's good for us to have to, again, once again, turn our hearts towards the Lord and say, Lord, we don't got it right. We need you. In every way, we need you. Hmm, cool stuff. So you guys have a great day. Um, Jeremiah 5 in the books. And we will hope everybody is doing good, you know, after that big storm. So you guys take care, okay? Thanks for joining me. Bye-bye.